Hi, for Medscape, I'm Alan Alda, and I'm talking with Helen Reese. Helen, you do this wonderful work at, at, on teaching empathy to physicians. How long have you been doing that? Uh, I've been doing the, about eight years now. That's close to how long I've been working with the uh, all the Center for Communicating Science to train scientists and physicians to communicate better. And it turns out both our work is joined by the need that I feel for empathy to be the, to considered the essential part of communicating. And there you are teaching what is for me the essential part of communicating. What What's the program called that you teach? Well, I... I teach empathy through the Mass General um, Empathy and Relational Science Program. And I founded Empathetics, which teaches empathy through online formats. And tell us a little bit about the Center for Communicating Science that you founded at Stony Brook. I'm very proud of it. We've been in operation for 10 years. We've done workshops in all 50 states and about eight other countries. And we've trained about 15, more than 15,000 researchers and physicians. And you see the difference. You see, and they report the difference. They, they've won awards for speaking to the public. But one of the things that's so interesting to me that we didn't expect was that it's not just speaking to the public and making science or medicine clear and vivid, but it's also speaking to one another. Teams work better in the lab or in the clinic. People get together and collaborate more effectively, the better they communicate. And, and there have been, I, I, you're more aware than I am, I'm sure, of the effect of empathy on the doctor-patient relationship, how it contributes to health. Absolutely. We've done numerous studies, some of them um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses that actually show that empathy, uh, when that's the only variable that's being changed, is um, an ingredient for better healthcare outcomes in areas such as obesity, asthma, um, unexplained medical illnesses, and a whole variety of impacts on hypertension and diabetes. So um, when we're in a pandemic like this, um, the topic of empathy is front and center because it really is part and parcel of what we need from each other, your teams to communicate well, and definitely from leadership. Um, and so that's one of the topics we wanna to explore today about the importance of being a leader with empathy. You know, it might be a good idea, since we're going to talk about empathy so much, to say what we mean by empathy, because there's a different definition almost for every person who uses it. A lot of people feel that empathy is synonymous with wishing the other person well, doing, doing good for the other person, being sympathetic, compassionate. Is, that's not how I see it. I see it in a more fundamental way. How do you see it? Well, I, I see empathy as a capacity. It's not just one thing, and it's not just feelings. It's also thinking. So it's an ability to resonate with other people in their emotional world, and also to take their perspectives and understand the context in which they're living. So it has both cognitive and emotional components. But it, 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 in the way I look at it, it's a first step toward um, taking positive action in aid of the other person, but it doesn't automatically lead to that. You have to decide to use your empathic understanding of their point of view to do exactly. something to help them, right? Right, empathy gets us to the motivation stage. We see pain and suffering, and if it's working, we are motivated to help, but you're right, not everybody takes that course of action. That well, there are people like bullies who use empathy to hurt the other people. They know what they're going through and they know how to manipulate them. But right. it's okay. So, so empathy is, for me, it's a, it's a, 
trying to take a good estimate of what the other person is going through, thinking and feeling both. And I think you can, you can get an estimate. You're not always totally accurate, but the better, the better you are at it, the better estimate you can get, in my opinion. But what about, what about leadership? How, how, does, how does empathy trickle down in leadership to the people being led? So in times of crisis, when the world feels upside down, nothing is clear, no one really knows what to do, it's a very difficult time to be a leader because there's so little information. And we have to get to sort of first principles to ground um, a, a leader's course of action. And first principles come back to, um, you know, really not just responsible leadership, but virtuous leadership. Because when there's a lot of ambiguity, if we can really believe that leaders are honest, compassionate, that they have integrity, that they are caring, that they have some optimism about getting people through a tough time, then we're more apt to absorb both the facts, the difficult facts of what we're facing, and also know that we're being leveled with, uh, with honesty, and that can direct our course of action. Do you think that when you're talking about a leader who you only know as a public figure, you don't know him personally or you don't know her personally, do you feel as I do, and maybe you don't, I'm really curious to know if trust is a really big factor in this? Because I remember there was a time when Walter Cronkite was thought of as the most trusted person in America. And the story was that when he decided the Vietnam War was the wrong way to go, that Lyndon Johnson said to somebody, that's it, it's over. He's, he's the one who's going to make America change their mind. So how, is trust important? And if it is, how do you, how do you gain it? I think that trust is earned. Um, it's earned through following through with promises. It's earned by arming oneself with the best information possible and relaying that clearly and um, being open to change when change is necessary. Uh, but I think trust really grows when people feel that the leader has empathy for them and has their best interest at heart. So that is a fundamental way that leaders gain support is through believing what they say and believing that they have their constituents best interest at heart. I think the reason I bring up trust is that especially where we're dealing with something that we don't understand like like the coronavirus. We we, we, I think, rely to a great extent on past experiences of people who haven't, um, who have been trustworthy to us and haven't, haven't led us astray. So as a result of that, we're liable to listen to what Aunt Tilly has to say because we know that she has our best interests at heart and not listen so much to a doctor on television or maybe even our own physician who we only see once in a while, and this is a really big issue, and how much should we give up our economic well-being for our supposed health well-being, which is generalized in a very free-floating way. We're talking about the health of the community. What about my health is what somebody is liable to be thinking, and they're liable to think of Antilles' advice <laughs> more than I hope I don't offend anybody named Tilly by saying that, but, but you, you know, there, there's the, how do you, how do you exercise your authority, the authority you have by the knowledge you have without turning away the person who doesn't know as much as you? Well, I think that's a real challenge. And in these times, um, it's, it's been very striking how many scientific terms are used on television and how many experts are brought in. And it's not clear to me that even the language or the level of vocabulary is, is uh, really available and digestible to everyone. 
So um, one question that I, I really wonder about is how do we reach people who are actually still denying that this is a problem, people who may be minimizing it because they haven't had direct contact with someone who's sick or someone who might be much more worried about their business going under than catching the virus. So in your vast work in Scientific American Frontiers, where you taught scientists how to relate and, and communicate their knowledge to the, to the lay public, what, what kinds of advice could you give to, um, to help with people who are still confused about whether this is really for real? I, I, one of the things we found at the Center for Communicating Science is that if you want to communicate with another person, you have to do more listening than they do. You have to be aware of what they're going through. Are they following you? Are they putting up little roadblocks in their head uh, because they've, you've used a term that they don't understand or they're f afraid of? What are they ready to hear? Maybe they're not ready to hear the worst news. Maybe they, maybe they need to hear more reassuring news. And maybe they need to have a help to, to, to help. Maybe they need you to help them to give them a boost in their empathy because the most impressive thing I've seen in, in what people are communicating publicly about it is save yourself and save the people you love by taking these precautions. I remember so vividly passing a group of young people, maybe in their late teens. We were in a car. We had to get out of the house and take a drive. We never got out of the car, but there were the six or eight kids who had gotten out of their cars milling around together. They clearly did not look like a group that lived together in one family. They were just getting together, not knowing where the others had been and what they'd touched. And they were, they looked confident that they weren't going to get anything, but it didn't look like they worried about people like me and my wife three times, four times their age. And that, that buildup of empathy among everyone seems to me to be very important where you, you don't do it for yourself. You do it for your grandmother. You do it for your mother and father or, or your sister who has a medical condition. I think that's such an important point that, um, you know, the invincibility of youth can, um, create some kind of a uh, shield that they're safe, but it, we, when we're young, when we're young, we think we're going to live forever. But we don't think, none of us thinks of ourselves as a vector of a lethal killer. So there was a group of nurses in Utah um, that put these masks on that said, um, we are here to take care of you, stay home. So, so that you can take care of us. Ah, uh, good. And it was a real appeal to empathy. Like, we're here to take care of you, but if you don't stay home, you know, we might catch it and no one's going to be here to take then, care of you. No, right, right. And so this whole reciprocal caring of one another is, um, is absolutely what our society really needs to be appealing to sort of the, the better part of all of us that realizes it's not just about me, but what I do has this huge impact on everyone else. Um, and I think in particular, to have leaders come across with genuine empathy, um, with straight talk, with the fact that people are gonna die. We're, we're, we're having topics on the daily you know, news feeds about the topic that most people wanna avoid more than anything, and that is, death. Yeah, Some people yeah. are going to die. And, and it's opened up, a, you know, a conversation about, you know, this is part of life and what we do today and whether we wash our hands or whether we stay home is going to impact whether people live or die. You know, some, we, we're getting to the end of, uh, of our talk. We're, we, we need to stop in a minute. But something, I wanted to mention something I've learned from you and your work. We have doctors 
and nurses all over the country who are exposed to the most harrowing tension producing experiences and the empathy that we want them to have to effectively deal with patients can overload them. I think, am I wrong? I think you teach physicians to get in with empathy and then before they get overwhelmed, get out. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, empathy is not a limitless supply. And so um, many places where I'm talking today, we're emphasizing the need for self-empathy and self-care, but also empathy for our coworkers. Um, you know, we focus a lot on the patients. Absolutely, we need to be there with them. But we also need to have coworkers where we can say, I'm starting to feel burned out, or I don't know, I feel like I need to cry with somebody. So we need to spread the empathy interprofessionally. And it also starts at the top. And the way healthcare organizations are, are communicating with their work teams um, you know, to recognize the sacrifices they're making, the risks they're taking. You know, no one goes into healthcare taking an oath that they're going to risk their lives. They take an oath to do no harm. Right. But many people are risking their lives, and it's because it's in them to care. To care. It's and amazing. I, mean, I, I think that one of the most touching things is the practice in New York City at 7 o'clock at night where the, the windows are opened and people express their appreciation to the healthcare workers. There's horns blowing and voices raised. It, it, it's, it's an amazing time we're going through. Are you able to give your training online during this period? Yes, through the empathetics programming, we have trained really thousands of people with empathy uh, connection and education tools that are being very much appreciated right now. Um, one of my, um, one of the people that I learned the most from in my training was Heinz Kohut, who called empathy psychological oxygen. Mm. And I love the term because when people are feeling frightened or sick, or overwhelmed, um, we have to remember that it's not just oxygen prongs that people need, but it's also psychological oxygen. They need to feel the support, the appreciation, and the outpouring of gratitude uh, for, for all the work they're doing. And, uh, you know, when it comes to leaders, that should be one of the loudest messages we're hearing is gratitude and thanks. Um, and it should really be about the people that are making this, this pandemic um, turn toward the better. That's so well said. And I'm glad you're able to keep this going while we're all sequestered. The Alder Center at Stony Brook is doing the same thing. We've changed all our face-to-face -face workshops uh, and adapted them to online training. So I'm so glad that we're able to pitch in at a time when it's so necessary. Well, it's great, great to, see you, to see you, Alan, and I hope we'll have another chance to talk.